at the center we do a number of things i don't know if you have or be in touch with the center, but um, our vision is all that aid, all aged care consumers in our Australia experience inclusive and accessible care. We build capacity um, for age, Australian aged care providers to deliver care that is welcome, inclusive, and accessible. And we do have a number of different focus areas. One is inclusive practice training workshops, like today, capacity building to promote um, cultural inclusion, equity, and diversity advice and consulting. We have um, supported by Benetas and funded by the Partners in Culturally Appropriate Care program short for PCAC. We will start off with a presentation from Dr. Susan Feldman about managing equal and mutually beneficial partnerships with multicultural communities from a research perspective and research that Susan has done. Then we'll have a panel discussion where we'll have uh, questions um, around the topic of um, mutually equi and equally beneficial partnerships. It's also an opportunity to ask questions about the presentation that Susan did or any questions you have about the topic, feel free to um, either put the question in the chat box or, um, ask, or unmute yourself and ask the question. So we're really looking forward to have an engaging panel discussion with you. And then um, Lisa Tribuzi, our manager, will launch the diversity webinar series for 2022-2023 and where you can go for support. Dr. Susan Feldman, she was one of the founding director of the Alma Unit for Women and Aging established in 1994 at the University of Melbourne. She was an associate professor, healthy aging, research unit at Victoria Monash University. She's currently a adjunct associate professor at Federation University, and her work has included in particular policy, social and health responses. And without further ado, I would like now to hand over to Susan. Thank you, Nikki, for your help and, and welcome, everybody. I also just want to thank the centre um, for inviting me today to talk about a piece of work that I did quite a while ago, but I'm, I'm told and reassured um, that, that very little work has followed on from this work, exploring the importance of uh, partnerships across the ethnic and multicultural community. I want to present my research and also... It's based on, my presentation is also based on my current experiences. Nikki, could I have the third slide, please, the context? Thank you. So my talk will be about, will really be grounded in my current experience as well, um, in the philanthropic and fund committees that I sit on. I hear these words banded around all the time. When people apply for funding, it's always, the question is always, are you in a partnership with anyone? Um, you must all understand this as well, constantly being asked, who are you partnering with? I also want to set it within the context of the COVID landscape because things have changed in terms of pressure on agencies, in terms of philanthropic and government funding. There's a lot of pressure on, on agencies to work in a different way as well. And also the changing cohort, the changing look of um, home and residential aged care um, and the, the numbers. We know the increasing numbers of people who are um, from multicultural and diverse backgrounds. We know that this is on the increase as well. So I was at a meeting last week where I heard a philanthropist who is a very well-known philanthropist talking about the way philanthropy works in partnership with each other. So when your application comes in, they're talking across the agents, across their philanthropic organisations as well. And so I was reminded again about the incredible importance of understanding how partnerships are seen and work. I want to introduce a project that was done a decade ago. But again, um, I'm reassured that there's been very little pickup not just from our work, but from the whole notion and understanding of what a partnership actually means. I want to describe to you what our project was about and present to you the findings. Uh, I suppose while you're listening to me, the big, big question is, are any of these findings still relevant today, 2022? And I, from my movement and my wandering around, yes, they are. They're, they're, I think, as relevant as they were and will remain so in this changing environment. Um, our setting for this research project was um, with services who are delivering, agencies delivering services to multicultural um, community dwelling older people rather than necessarily aged care, but including aged care facilities. Um, I think we wanted to know about the current experiences of the inter-organisational partnerships 
in the multicultural um, community and, and how the, what the community thinks are some of the barriers to actually and facilitators to actually engaging in, in partnership arrangements to better improve services, service delivery. Um, the, the report that I'm going to be talking to is available on the Ethnic Community Councils of Victoria website. I do believe it's still there. Um, next slide, please, Nikki. So the research aims for this particular project um, was to explore the role and experiences of the partnerships of those within the ethnic multicultural aged care sector um, and how the needs of the older people may be addressed. So our working definition of a partnership. Now, there are many, there are many definitions, but we, this definition is based on our steering committee that, that comprised people from the ethnic, uh, ethnic Community Council of Victoria, uh, from other community agencies, and also a, an extensive literature search. And one of the, the, the um, pieces of literature that we turned to was, again, it's old, but it's not so old and it hasn't been replaced, we believe, it was Vic Health. Uh, in 2009, they actually developed a, a definition of what, what is a partnership. We all think we know what a partnership is, but it's uh, fairly um, complicated business to develop a partnership. So Himmelman, Himmelman, uh, an academic researcher, has actually described uh, and it remains so today. And I think you would, all of you would understand that this is not step by step by step by step. This is a fluid, a fluid arrangement between agencies, between individuals, between people trying to establish a working relationship. Um, and Himmel offers us, Himmelman offers us a way of thinking about it, what it is. So networking, networking, everybody says, that understand what networking is. Okay, it's pretty simple. We network every day, don't we? Every day, part of our networking. It's about exchanging information for a common goal. Coordinating is exchanging information and altering activities and the sharing of resources to, in order to enable to reach that goal. Cooperating, of course, it's clear. We cooperate with each other. We share information. We share facilities, we share sometimes funding, but we're cooperating with each other to better improve our work. And collaborating is actually not only exchanging information, but it's modifying our activities, sharing our resources even more, and most importantly, a willingness to enhance the capacity of another organisation in order to reach a common goal. So whilst we think they're all the same, they really are quite different, but brought together, um, we can actually enhance the way agencies and individuals achieve positive outcomes and common goals. So my question is, is this a partnership? Is it just getting to know you, uh, having a coffee, uh, touchy-feely? Wouldn't it be good if we worked in a partnership without any formal structure around our work without an understanding that a, 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 a friendly relationship is based on individuals. So what I want to talk more about uh, when, when we talk about our findings, which of course were generated by our participants, uh, is more than just a friendship between people working in agencies because people, personalities, people come and go. This is very informal, whilst it is really, really valuable. We all know the value of partnerships and friendships within organisations. We're talking more about a more structural approach. And the word partnership is used so freely. And the only true partnership at the very end of the spectrum is a merger. And I'm not talking about mergers here. So perhaps what I'm what I'm trying to say is there's a real need to develop a specific working definition within the sector to enable that work to continue and flourish. Um, next slide, please, Nikki. Um, just a, as an idea, the, our work included men and women and the organisations were very wide ranging. Uh, it was not a huge study. It was in terms of numbers, but, but the people who took 
part in our study were managers, they were representative of their organisation and they had some authority within their organisations as well as coordinators and people who delivered services on the ground. Next, please, Nikki. So our questions were, so what, why does your organisation seek to form partnerships with other organisations? Now, I think this is a really um, key, key question for any organisation to ask themselves. Why? Why do we bother? What's the purpose? Um, also now, well, what kind of factors influence your organisation's ability to actually do this work with other organisations? And what does it take? What kind of work, what kind of resources, what kind of energy? And also the, the downside of that, what are the factors that hinder that formation and maintenance of partnerships? So what I'm going to represent are the findings, and these were generated by the participants in, the, in our study. And also we kept referring backwards and forwards to the literature, of course, to see if this was in line with um, our findings. So we'll go to the findings. So um, four major ones, that there are many, many different versions of, of definitions of partnerships, as I explained in the beginning with Himmelman, and they're interchangeable. Um, there's also a very wide variety of, of the benefits of forming partnerships. And again, I, I, for those of you who are here from community agencies and service agencies, you, you understand very well what the benefits might be, not only to the organisation, of course, but to the um, users of your services, to older people themselves. What are the benefits of doing this? And the influences on partnerships I'm going to explore. And then, of course, the questions about the future of partnerships in this current environment, because it hasn't gone away. And in fact, I think it's being exacerbated. As I said, uh, COVID has changed things, uh, government funding, philanthropic focus, foci, where, where they want to put their money, etc. So defining partnerships. And this was, uh, this, these were the words of some of the participants. So um, I think, I think the second one, we cooperate together. Well, that, that goes back to what him and what was talking about. Cooperation. We've got the same goal to help the client, but I don't think you could call it a partnership. I think that's exactly right. That's exactly the nut of it, so to speak. Okay, is a network a partnership? Now, I already spoke about that. Is a network a partnership? Well, it's not um, because it very much depends on individuals, people uh, working in agencies, uh, personalities, their desires, their wishes to form a partnership, and also who initiates the partnership. That's also very, very important. Um, there was a consensus amongst all of the participants that it's very useful to form a network to share ideas and information. That would be the first thing. And networks are very important, maybe first step in building trust between agencies and between people who work across the sector. That, that part of tr trust is part of forming relationships. And I don't have to tell you that that trust can easily be broken um, and people do trust each other and share resources and information but at often informal informal level which is how I like to work informally um, sometimes networking was seen as tokenistic by the participants especially when meetings were organized to meet funding body requirements now I'll come to this a little bit later sometimes Governments and other organisations require you, agencies and personnel, to form partnerships. And they're what I like to call unholy alliances. Sometimes the only thing in common is that you work within a multicultural community. Or for me, as a researcher, we're brought together in teams, but we have no history and we don't have shared values or interests, but we have to come together for the funding. And I think this is incredibly important to remember that some of these alliances are not exactly going to work right from the beginning. So we'll go to some more positive news, the benefits. 
So um, you can't do it by yourself. And this is what all of the agencies kept saying then, and I hear this now all the time. We've got limited resources, we've got limited staff, uh, we can't do all the work ourselves. We're not specialists in everything, and we need and want to form relationships with other other agencies also to access resources, resources in the community, within government, within philanthropy. Um, it avoids tokenism, the benefit of a partnership. You know, you've got to be real. And you might say to someone over coffee or at a conference, oh, we, we need to work in partnership. Oh, why don't you call me? Here's my card or get me on LinkedIn. But people don't really think that they want to really develop working relationships with you. And it takes time to develop a real working relationship based on respect and trust. Um, it really, in the end, the benefits of partnerships are to improve the health and well-being and the quality of life of your clients. I think that's what you're about. But it's also about improving professionals' working life and capacity and making work so much um, better, but more than that, taking pressure off agencies that are struggling to do it all, because that's not possible to do it all. The key influences on partnerships, again, from the participants were improving professional capacity, as I said. You, 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 you won't enter into a relationship, or sometimes you do, where the other agency or the individual just can't deliver. They just can't, they've got no interest, they haven't got the skills. This is really, really difficult. And I don't know how often you've experienced this, but someone says, yes, 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 let's form a partnership and you're doing, your agency's doing all the work. It's really something that's got to be uh, much more formally um, worked out. Um, trusting, I mentioned before, trusting relationships, Trust is based, isn't it, on relationship building. If you can't trust someone, if you can't trust an agency, uh, maybe maybe you don't trust an individual, maybe there's no trust about where the funding goes, how it's distributed, who signs the documents if you're receiving funding, have to build a trusting relationship. But often people are prejudiced based on poor relationships in the past. You carry that with you into a relationship and some agencies are not as good as others in building that trust within communities within the sub 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 community people bring mistrust from other places into their work and about other communities and this was raised again um, by the participants so it's another influence with the external influences as the night as i said before there are top-down forces maybe government uh, funding bodies who say, no, no, your work, our funding is for you to work here. As you can see, you're not, you're funded to do this and nothing more. And things like, yes, you've got a vehicle and you can use that vehicle between Monday and Friday, but you can't use it on the weekend, you know, to assist someone or someone outside of your catchment area, et cetera. So you're, you've got to comply. Um, with funding bodies, and I think that the external influences and community expectations really affect that. And then the mosaic of ethnic ageing communities, and you know this better than I, that there are so many different communities um, in, 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 in your field. How do you choose who to work with? Is it around specific issues? Is it around certain communities? Is it around geographical locations? Um, some groups are the flavour of the month, we hear. So do you go there and, and form a partnership with that group? Um, this changes. Uh, there's lobbying going on, there's political expediency going on, you've got to be watching where the funding's going to which community. So partnerships can assist with that. Uh, as well, if they're well-founded, well-grounded and real. I guess, again, I'm speaking to the converted you, many of you would understand that the organisations have limited capacity to deliver and form partnerships. Partnerships, they take time, they take energy, they take resources. Um, it may be a volunteer 
dependent and many, many small agencies depend totally on volunteers to keep their agencies going and do the work or the management committees or the boards. They're all most often volunteers. So there's a limitation to what's on offer. Um, smaller agencies particularly are, are very vulnerable to this. Um, they're disadvantaged smaller agencies. They're doing the work, but they don't have the resources, the staff, the funding, often even the reputation. They haven't made a, a, a foothold yet into the community. And of course, there's that issue about power. Smaller agencies have much less power and we'll come to that in a minute. And this is likely to influence partnerships and the power I mean within negotiations with other agencies. Um, there are limited resources, as one of the participants said. Um, it, it, it's all very well to say, we'll have a meeting today to think about a partnership, but how are you going to spare a worker if you've got only a part-time point two worker or a volunteer can only come in on a Thursday and yet the meeting's been arranged for Friday morning? It, all of these things have to be taken into account and they limit, they limit the opportunities for developing meaningful partnerships. So these, these quotes just really illustrate what happens when you've got limited resources in smaller agencies who are often so disadvantaged. Uh, we talked before about the capacity of a smaller agency. It's about training. People come and do fantastic work, but they're not trained in writing submissions or, or doing um, uh, plans or doing KPIs, et cetera. They are doing the work, the hands-on work. Um, the second quote, of course, is um, the final say, of course, often rests with mainstream partners. And if you're a small organisation, how do you get a voice if you want to partner with a mainstream uh, organisation? You've got to negotiate that. And that's maybe difficult for some, maybe it's not for others, but that is a limitation in forming a partnership with a larger organisation. Where do you fit? Where's your power? How do you exercise that power within that relationship? So we talk about the power within those organisations. Often it's not equal, limited power. We look at the size of the organisations. Smaller organisations are disadvantaged just because of their size, just not having enough people to, to leave the work and go and negotiate or spend hours talking about what planning. Um, the relationships between people, as I said earlier, about trust, is then very personality-based in a small organisation. Can't share the load because there might only be 10 of you and, and you're all part-time, et cetera. So there's no sharing, no possibility to share that building of a relationship. Um, the resources that are difficult are around staffing, funding and skills development, developing the skills to do this kind of partnership development. And then you've got the pressure from government, changing policy, and smaller agencies are just as vulnerable and have to comply as larger agencies, if not more. Finally, some strategies, which came from the participants um, themselves. So there's got to be equality. Equality, um, we know that, I've, sp I've spoken about, but that's pretty difficult. Um, but as one person noticed, noted, you need the power to be equal and financial responsibility to be equal as well. So where does the money go if you get money? Where does the, the skills development and training, who gets most? Is it an, an equal relationship? This agency's got 50 people, this agency's got 10. It's got to be worked out. That's difficult. Um, you have to have a formal relationship somebody designated, someone with authority and a voice, the responsibility for developing these partnerships, which then other people in your organisation can actually benefit from. So making a pathway into that relationship. Um, people have to have roles that are identified, clear roles. Well, I'll sit on, I'll come to your board meeting, you'll come to mine, I'll do the minutes, you'll do the minutes. 
funding agreements, we can sign this, you can sign that. There's got to be clearly identifiable roles between the agencies and that brings with it responsibilities, roles and responsibilities. Education, people in agencies are constantly needing and wanting education about the latest government policies around governance, around management of funding. There's got to be opportunity for education across within the partnership, how to nurture the partnership. And as I said, the opportunity for this within organisations. This is difficult when you've got a small agency. Two and minutes. also, thank you. And then the protocols and processes, they must be in place. They've got to better define the roles and the responsibilities within the partnership. What does it mean for my organisation if I enter into some kind of a partnership formal or we will get to formal in the end? We'll work towards a formal partnership with all the benefits, with all of some of the problems we'll face, formal protocols and processes. If an agency wants to enter in a functioning, high-level, uh, beneficial relationship with another, just to finish and to say thank you both to my research partners who are involved in this project, just to, there is a reference on ECCB's website, I've been told, still there, and a publication which actually is online as well. And you can contact me and I thank you for your time and I hope that the learnings from your communities, which is what I gathered, really are helpful in thinking about positive partnerships, yes or no. So thank you very, very much. It was a great presentation and was very insightful. And, you know, just to recap some of the things you were saying, partnerships takes time, resources, volunteers and energy. And I think that's a really good, um, a really good um, reminder for us doing partnerships. It takes people to work on these partnerships, to connect with organizations, and so on and so forth. So thank you for your amazing presentation. I'm going to introduce now Hyatt to you, Hyatt Dogen. Um, Hyatt has many years of experience in case <coughs> management, settlement services, family violence prevention, and community engagement. In her current role as Carers Capacity Building Project Officer at the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria, Hyatt seeks to address the needs of carers from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. This includes raising awareness about carer support services, improving access to information about health and financial well-being, and linking carers to carer support groups. Welcome, hi, to the panel. Okay, Susan, I've already introduced to you. Maybe we'll start with you, Hyatt. From your experience, why can it be challenging to develop mutually beneficial partnership between multicultural communities and aged care organizations? Uh, first, I would like to say thank you for the nice introduction and thank you, Susan, for a very informative uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it and uh, I found it like the, the, the information you shared are the same things that I experienced and I believe in. Uh, going back to your question, Nicola, uh, it is challenging to uh, start partnership between organization uh, for many reasons. One of the reasons, uh, most organization, the mainstream organization, they're the, the one who's got the funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when it comes to multicultural uh, organization, they're a smaller organization. Who has the more power is mm -hmm. the mainstream organization. Yeah. They need to be uh, partnering with multicultural organization to understand more the needs in for the, the in the community and mm -hmm. to learn how to respond to it. Susan, what's your um, view? And you have already elaborated a lot already a little bit in the in your presentation. Anything that you would like to add from your perspective? Building on what Hayat said, in I've. I've worked a lot in multicultural communities, particularly in, in remote and rural communities, and I thought I knew how to do that. I thought I understood that. I thought that I could work, oh, I've got all this information and knowledge and I know what people eat and I know, you know, the music and all that. But it came down to, for me, understanding how language is used, how, and I, 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 
I learned very, very, very fast <laughs> that words I used, I thought I'd had them translated, were not relating. So our understanding was different. So then you go to a big agency that, that thinks they understand, but but at the at the base of it all, the, the people aren't communicating. The language is different. Mm. And so it's not just words, but it's concepts, mm. the concepts. So I, I agreed. It, it was very, very difficult to do that. But there is a benefit to people working together, I think, more and more and more because of the limited resources. So I think there has to be a real effort made. As you said, Hayat, some of those people can't be bothered. They give it up because mm. it's hard and it takes time. And you have to be real and say, we really want to do this work because it's beneficial to us and to the community. So I think it's that uh, that real uh, endeavour where people really are, are legitimate in their desire. Can you think of any partnership models or partnerships that you've experienced that are working well and why you thought they were working well? Anyone who wants to start, either Susan or Hayat? I would like to start uh, because I have a very positive experience that I need to share with everyone. And uh, there are two types of partnership, a collaboration, I would call it, not a partnership. Yeah. With, within any organization, you have this, part, this collaboration between case managers, between workers. This is not official, but we all do it to, to, to support our client. We use networking, we use our connection with different organizations, with the person, the, the people who work in other organization. And with the, the, the process of referral, yeah. it is a very good, like positive proof. It is a proof that this collaboration are beneficial and are working. So this is already happening within but when we come to uh, the official you know collaboration and partnership between organizations uh, it's not very uh, it's starting so i'm going to share my uh, my current experience mm -hmm. so i work at ethnic communities councils victoria and we have a partnership with keras victoria and i'm happy to say this partnership is working perfectly for me, uh, because, because of this partnership, I'm able to deliver what I need to deliver in my project because of partnership, because uh, there are things that ECCV cannot do, like client service, for example, working with client, the, the referral, uh, case management, these things we cannot provide. That's why we have Keras Victoria working with us. Also the capacity building. Uh, yeah. My role, I would look for the carers and seniors from multicultural background who need support. I, I, I engage with them, I see what they need. And with the support of Carers Victoria, we work together, we, we're doing it like, uh, it's collaboration and co-design at the same yeah. time. Yeah. So we decide what, what the capacity building session we need to run, Keras Victoria. So by follow my advice, we need this, this, this for this group or these people. And my role also is to advise Keras Victoria to be culturally uh, responsive and inclusive. Uh, every uh, presenter before facilitator before they present for my group, they call me and we work together. They ask questions about the group and uh, what what exactly they need what do we need to talk and they tailor their presentation following my advice so this work in by 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 this partnership this collaboration we are able to support the people we're working with uh, in a better way and we started to see uh, good outcomes of it what you've just said illustrates for me perfectly that it's a collaboration where you've mutually agreed yep. that there is a need and that one agency can bring its expertise to another. Like we both complement each other. Yes, and you've agreed that there's a designated person 
you that gives advice and expertise which is respected. So you've got a mutual project yes. and you want an outcome. And I think what your what you've just said is perfectly illustrates a relationship that works, but you're not in partnership at this, you collaborate, you've got an agreement and you've got finances, you've got money. We've got money. Uh, we are uh, col like Keras Victoria is collaborating with us and yes. we provide the money to them yes. Yes. based on uh, their work with us. And there is an, an agreement, detailed agreement on everyone's role. What is the role? What is my role? What is the other people's role? Everything is written, which is very important. And I would advise any partnership to have this document because mm -hmm. sometimes we have to go back look at our agreement and see what everyone is supposed to do and we follow it. It's, it's, uh, it took us a long time before we started working together to set this agreement, but now it's saving us time and saving some, uh, you know, disagreement or things like, uh, for example, uh, now we're talking, we're working on the evaluation. So, we, we had to go back to our agreement to mm -hmm. see what is exactly, uh, what does ECCB wants from Keras Victoria? What information we read from them, what they need, how they can support this evaluation report that I'm be working on. So it's all done, it's, it's, it's working perfectly. And I'm happy to say there is like, uh, first the trust, the mutual, mutual agreement, we both uh, care, like, uh, from my side and from uh, the other uh, worker, the person I'm working with from Keras Victoria, we are we both have uh, like the best of interest for the people we're working with. This the common the common goal for us. We have both the same goal. Our both organization have the same vision, and we both working on supporting those carers and seniors from uh, multi, uh, culturally diverse and linguistically diverse background. You've just, you've just done a little micro uh, case study, haven't you? Yes. Because all those elements, um, yeah. yeah, all of those elements, you came together to achieve a goal. Before we go to the next one, just go a question from an a, a audience here and just and seeing you, what your opinions are. So Robin says, I'm co developing a consumer partnership framework that will be used across our five services within Grampians Health and will cover the whole Grampians region, which includes many different communities. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions what should be included in the framework about engaging multicultural communities. Look, be yourself and when you have in your heart this desire this passion about helping people and supporting people from uh, migrant and refugees background, it shows people feel that you're genuine when you're engaging with them. You can, a person can say all the nice words and all the jargon, but people sense if they're real, real or not. This is what I mean by, by being, being honest. Uh, you have, Anyone can say I'm culturally inclusive and responsive and you know I'll, I like to support people, but uh, when, you, when they're engaging, people sense that not real, they're doing it because this is their job, right. they have to do it. But when you do it as your job and your passion at the same time, this is when you can engage better with multicultural communities. Show them respect, don't look down on them, sometimes, Susan mentioned the language. I would add the, 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 the body language also. Yeah, yeah. The, first, the first time you look or you talk to someone, the impression they get from you, it will, it will stay for them, especially for uh, people from cult background. This is very important for them to feel that you're, you respect them, you're not looking down on them. Someone, sometimes with the question you ask or some some type of, one look can make them feel that you are you think less of them. I would just add that if if 
people are developing a document, then they've got to actually spell out clearly from the beginning uh, how this will happen in terms of human resources, resources of the, the organisation, time resources, training, and some of the points I put up, which the participants and my work has told me, that you can't, you can write every document you like, but unless you've got the processes and the structure in place to enable that document to happen, to be worked and to be actioned, then all the writing on the page is meaningless, isn't it? It's how it's going to happen or how to facilitate that action. When um, consumer directed care was introduced, and uh, uh, do you think that has changed the landscape of partnerships from, you know, in the, from sort of, for, for example, in CHSP from block funding to individualized funding, do you think that has impacted on, on the landscape of partnerships? This is not a landscape that I'm absolutely familiar with at the moment, but I think the larger organisations gobbled up a huge amount of funding. And then we went into COVID, remember? And remember that, and I think there was this incredible pressure on uh, aged care. Um, home care, of course, has always been underfunded, yeah? So consumer directed, I mean, I think people are really, really struggling right now to get the kind of services that they need at home, even though we've seen aged care packages at home increased and increased and increased, it's still vastly underfunded, so we've got two streams, haven't we? We've got people who are at home who are vastly underfunded. Workers, of course, are almost are so difficult to get because of COVID and the money going into aged care to provide the best during this pandemic for people in care. So, Nikki, I don't know right now where we sit. I think it'll be really important to keep, um, and we've got a new federal government, to keep the the eye on where the funding is going now because will it go into the larger organizations i suspect it will because of the incredible panic and also the high number of older people who are so vulnerable in care and that includes people in ethno-specific or multicultural services or whatever and then we've got people at home who are as vulnerable as they've ever been before, I believe, because of the lack of workers, the inability to get the right amount of care at home. So I can't answer except to say, I think we're in a very, very critical time. And one other comment about the Royal Commission findings, that's going to have a very profound impact if it's activated, I will wait and see, with where the funding goes. Mm. Where is the funding going to go now in order to satisfy the Royal Commission? Uh, there, were, there were many, many recommendations about um, culturally diverse communities as well. But do you think, do you think that money is going to go where? Aged care? People in home? I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you any better answer than that. What I've sometimes observed is that, you know, because of the funding model being more individualised, there's often not a specific, you know, funding is often not allocated to actually fund partnerships because it's all about the client. So there's actually it's less the resources for the yes. for the organizations to partner. So that's great. In terms of just closing it, are there any final comments from you of the panelists in terms of what you can recommend, how we can work together more in partnership between ethnic and multicultural organizations? Anything you haven't said you want to share before we um going to launch our diversity webinar series? Bayat said before which encapsulates a goodwill, good intention, outcomes for the, for the client, for the older person, and a willingness, a willingness to work in equal relationships. And, the, and I think the knowledge and expertise to do it, because not everybody can do what you do, Hart, in a relationship. You need skills and you need the willingness and the ability, don't you? And we need to trust each other also. Absolutely. If you're going into a relationship where there is no trust, definitely it's going to fail. This That's right. That's right. So between organizations, if if they, they both should have uh, be able to trust each other, uh, that they both have the same vision and measure, uh, and you know, 
to what they want to achieve, same goals for the organization and the, and they need to be uh, honest about it because some maybe we have two organizations together, but one of them is more uh, cares more about the benefit, and the other organization they care more about to deliver and to support the community. Everyone wants to to make money, you know, to to support the organization and to support the people who work there. But this shouldn't be our prime goal, not. The second goal, making money, but also delivering, not just ticking boxes. Unfortunately, some organizations, they tick boxes. They do stuff just to say, OK, this is what the government fund us to do. We're doing it. But they're not like really doing the right job they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Hyde and Susan, for the fabulous panel discussion. I also want to thank everybody who contributed in the chat box or, or you know, who raised questions or had comments. Thank you very much for that. It was a really um, good contribution. I really enjoyed the conversation with both of you. Thank you, Nicholas, for holding the space for this webinar and for the very, very interesting conversations that have been had um, around the complexity of partnerships, but also the very important topic around power you know, which when you've got two relationships, um, two people, sorry, two organisations entering into a, a a partnership, the idea of power and resources, who's got more resources, where the resources go, because we find that sometimes some people from multicultural organisations are over-consulted um, and it's assumed that they're going to do it voluntarily. Um, but their expertise is, is part of, is very important. So it's really important to advocate for that. Um, so thanks for your contributions there. So now we're really excited to let you know about um, the next um, 12 months here at the Centre for Cultural Diversity and our of Centre for Cultural Diversity and Aging and our monthly webinar series. Um, and so we've, we've been, um, well, not partnering, but I guess consulting and collaborating um, with lots of um, industry experts. Um, we've got over 24 industry experts involved in our diversity webinar series. It's exciting. They're all for free. Um, for you to access via our website. And here it is. So um, what do we have? We have these webinars. Um, and as you can see, they're all the headshots of all the people that have kindly given us their time and expertise um, in the different topics that we've actually decided to do for the next financial year. Um, we have come up with these topics in collaboration with industry leaders and um, feedback from aged care providers. After we do our webinars, we send a post-webinar survey. So expect to get that at four o'clock today um, for you to give us some topics of what you'd like to talk about. So in the last webinar series, we've gathered all the responses from the providers and here's what we've come up with. The first one in July is free translations in aged care. So we encourage you to register for that because it's about a project that the Australian government um, has funded as part of the budget measure, which has come out of the Royal Commission to fund language services in aged care. And so that is um, that the fact that now all Australian government funded aged care providers can get access to free translations tailored to your individual needs. So if you send them a request about what you want, a lifestyle calendar, a brochure, something in your newsletter, anything, they can translate that for you. And that's part of ICON agency. So that's exciting. August, we have collective diversity data. Now that's been a really important topic. Um, and again, the Australian government has just released its diversity education project to which it will give Australian government funded aged care providers a diversity advisor to help them gather diversity data in order to support their diversity programming and practices. And so that's going to be mentioned in that webinar, but also we've got some amazing um, models of how to collect data from your staff and your consumers. Um, in order to say, okay, these are the trends within our organisation and how do we respond appropriately? It could relate to languages that are most commonly spoken to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, it could relate to um, certain spiritualities or faith diversity that's in your organisation. Um, and thanks, Ree, for your comment there. I really appreciate your support. Uh, for September, we have a, a revisit of our inclusive service standards for beginners. Um, and so that's um, the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Aging's framework. We're just going to be revisiting that. It's a workshop, interactive workshop, uh, where you're at with your diversity planning. October, we have 10 steps to developing a diversity plan. So this relates to leaders in the aged care sector. You know, we're trying to um, 
sort of break down the idea of diversity strategy, creating a diversity strategy um, into a 10-step process. And of course, it's not that easy, but, um, you know, we really want to make it more, um, oops, <laughs> there goes my torch on my phone. Um, so, yeah, we want to make it easy for people to, um, to sort of understand how to do that. Um, for November, we've got supporting older people from culturally diverse backgrounds with a hearing impairment. And I thought when I when I actually consulted with the, the facilitators um, who are running this webinar, I thought it was a really interesting topic because there's a not a lot of Auslan interpreters that speak different languages. And so how do we support older people with a hearing impairment? That was really interesting. Um, and then we're going to have a bit of a break for December and January, of course, because we've got all the things, all the holidays and all the breaks. Um, and we're going to have our industry breakfast in December. So uh, we will invite you all to our industry breakfast at the Islamic Museum of Victoria in December. Um, February, we've got Food for Thought, the link between food, culture and identity. Um, and that's looking at menu diversity, um, how to co-design um, food and um, nutritional practices with consumers in residential care or home care or any kind of programs that you run. And the link between food, culture um, and storytelling and memory. Uh, March, we're going to be celebrating Harmony Week with our video launch on the voices of multicultural community leaders and their visions for a, a more inclusive aged care system to which we interviewed older people who are community leaders and um, we got their visions for what they think their members might need. That's a really, really great film coming out by Red Hat Films. Really excited about that. April, we'll be recognising multi-faith initiatives and that's really important too because we, 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 we kind of do promote the you know, the idea that culture and faith are very much linked, aren't they? <laughs> and so um, we're going to be collaborating with Meaningful Aging Australia and spiritual um, and faith leaders um, from a range of different faith backgrounds. It's really exciting. In May, we've got our culturally diverse perspectives on mental health care, another really important topic relating. It's come up a lot within our consultations of depression, anxiety, um, trauma, um, this is not trauma-informed care. This is going to be relating to just mental health at general, but the whole idea of transcultural mental health, the whole idea of multicultural mental health and the intersection, um, you know, between um, mental health services and multicultural sector. Um, and then June, our final one is actually a walk and talk. So our final one is a Victorian-based initiative. Um, in collaboration with a friend of the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Aging, Uncle Shane Charles, who is a local Aboriginal community leader uh, that we've been working alongside this year and really got a lot of knowledge, local Aboriginal knowledge. Um, and so he's going to be giving us a walk down the Yarra River. We'll be meeting at um, Enterprise Wharf in the city. And he's going to just basically talk about the Yarra River and some sacred sites, some healing sites, and there'll be a didgeridoo healing ceremony as well. So you can register for any of these webinars uh, via our website or if you look at the QR code now, if you just get your mobile phones and click on the QR code, it'll take you straight to the link. Alternatively, you can go to our website under Professional Development, um, Diversity Webinar Series tab, um, and you'll be able to register there. So they're all available now. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, always open to more suggestions. And over to you, Nikki. There's a few things you want to mention where, where, where people can go for support. So you're probably aware of our website. Um, and Lisa just mentioned the training and professional development. If you go to that tab, you will find out about that diversity webinar series for the next financial year. Um, also, one of our key resources are the inclusive service standards and resources, um, which you can access our good practice stories from, you know, key people from the sector and obviously our multilingual resource, which include our um, communication cards, which are quite frequently used, for example, in, you know, care settings and help help with communication needs in different languages. Um, yeah, the inclusive service standards, they were developed just quickly, um, but developed by us to um, assist aged care providers in development and deliver of inclusive service to all consumers. And there's also specific, uh, in, under the website, as I mentioned, there's one area that just covers the inclusive service standards. And they really provide a framework for service to adapt and improve the services and organ organizational practices. So they're welcoming, safe and accessible. So there's different things you can explore under the, under, under the inclusive service standards, um, including a portal that we have. You've 
you are encouraged to register at the portal. And in the next financial year, we'll probably have more opportunities to support organizations with targeted um, diversity coaching with the inclusive service standards. Just our, some of our key practice guides that we're having, culture inclusive feedback, and Lisa mentioned 10 steps to developing a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, in aged care, we will have a specific webinar on that, working with bilingual staff. So yeah, just sort of short resources, two or three pages to help you on that specific topic to uh, make your organization a bit more culturally inclusive. Um, and um, there are great ways to start. For example, if you want to do something around core design, there's a, a practice guide on core design working with core consumers. Um, this is a poster you can download from our website. It's really about reminding people in your organization that you can access resources from the Center for Cultural Diversity and Aging. We're here to help you, here to support you on your journey because really it's a journey. Cultural inclusion doesn't happen one day or another day, it takes time. And um, same with partnerships, it's, it takes time and investment. So yeah, we, we are happy here to support you and feel free to you know put the poster in, in your facility and people can directly contact us if they want further information or want specific communication card in a specific language, um, we can help out with that. Um, obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are part of the Center of the Center for Cultural Diversity in Aging. We are part, part, part of the PCAC program, Partners in Culture Appropriate Care. We're part of a, an alliance, PCAC Alliance. It's a national body comprising of each PCAC organization in each state and territory. And we really want to be discussion conduit into information and training to inform aged care and community services. Um, and that's one of the projects going to be at the webinars. I'm not going to talk much about it, but just mentioning that increasing access to translating, interpreting a service aged care project that we have a webinar on. Uh, you will find out more about that, but really you can get at the moment through that project. And there's an email at the, at the, at the bottom of this slide. You can I ask for translations for the resources you have for any things that you want to be translated. You can access um, access that and you can contact I can agency for that purpose. That's really it for today. We're a bit um, ahead of time, which is good, giving a bit of your time back of the day. We really thank you for all your participation, for the comments, for your interest in the topic. And if you um, would like more information, you can go to our LinkedIn page, to our web page can go to our YouTube channel and also thank Sarah from Red Hat Phil for all the work behind the scenes to make this webinar happening for happen for today. And yeah, it's been, has been great. Thanks everyone for your participation and we hope to see you soon in the next financial year.